Welcome to the podcast, Your Future in Sales and Marketing, the podcast that helps you make great career decisions. My name is Mike Dixon, and I'm a professional sales and marketing recruiter. I love what I do, but my biggest frustration is seeing too many people not realizing their career potential. In this podcast, I'll introduce you to my network, an amazing group of business leaders from the biggest tier one organizations through to some super fast growth SMEs. They'll share their career journeys and give unique advice and insights on managing your career and leading a function and a business. Join me, Mike Dixon of AXR Recruitment and Search to help guide your future in sales and marketing. Hello and welcome to another episode of Your Future in Sales and Marketing. We've given Mike the day off today. I'm Andrew Kennick. I'm a specialist FMCG sales and category recruiter in Mike's team. And uh, I'm really excited to be joined today by some superstars of the Sydney FMCG scene as we talk all things category management. So whether you're already working in category or maybe you're category curious and considering a move into the function, we've got hopefully a great discussion lined up for you today. Uh, we'll be talking about what category is, how it differs across different businesses, how it's evolving now and into the future, and then importantly, what this all means for you and your career. And so to help me do that in no particular order, I'm joined by Angela Craven, Head of Category and Shopper at George Western Foods, Chris Mackay, Head of Category Development for Hygiene at Reckitt, and um, returning guest, Kate Bean, Head of Category, Revenue and Commercial Planning at Kellogg's. Great to have you here, guys. So before we jump in, we'll do a quick whip around to let our listeners know a bit more about, about you. So I've got two questions for you. Um, one is our traditional icebreaker on the pod, which is what is your favorite brand and why, and not one that you work on or have worked on previously. And two, how did you find yourself working in category? So Ange, I'll throw over to you. Kick us off. What is your favorite brand and why? Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call out um, Koala. I think they're one of these ultimate disruptors in the market. They're a pure e-commerce player. I really find them super exciting, particularly around their sustainability and their social responsibility agenda. And what I really love about them is they've really broken down the kind of barriers around why you wouldn't change your mattress, which I think is really laddering back to driving frequency of purchase. So what they do is they pick up your old mattress and they dissemble it and then they use all of the parts of mattress into making another product. Mm -hmm. So I think that is just a fantastic way of overcoming the kind of barriers around frequency of purchase. So I, I get really excited when I look at the online platform. I also kind of follow them as a business. I know that they are also um, donating a lot of money to the WWF fund. So a part of their social responsibility agenda is they're helping the koalas out as well. So I think there's just some really good, solid ethics and business grounding for that, that company. And at the moment, I'm looking for a new mattress. So I'm super <laughs> excited to be researching them. So, yeah. Awesome. And a, and a great example of a, a, a true disruptor. Yeah. Who made that whole industry think about how to do things differently. Agreed. And how did you find yourself working in category? Yeah. So a um, bit of a convoluted story. I'll keep it really short. Um, but I grew up in the north of England. Um, and let's put it this way, kind of you take opportunities when they, they come, um, uh, particularly coming from a small kind of working class um, kind of town. And I actually, I found myself in FMCG, first of all, before I went into category, um, because I took an opportunity to work for um, McVitie's as a sponsored student whilst I was doing my A-levels. So before I went to university, that's when I learned about FMCG. I had no idea about FMCG. I didn't have a clue what it was all about. I learned about it from that business. So when I left university and I went down to London, because all of my pals went down to London, they're all solicitors, lawyers, et cetera. I found myself going for a job with Unilever as a category analyst. And that was my first job actually in the company where I was working on bird's eye peas, uh, which wasn't the sexiest of categories. <laughs> I wanted to work in ice cream, but bird's eye peas was going to cut it for me. So I started there, I started in category. And then I found myself because Unilever is such an amazing business, um, getting tapped on the shoulder, moving around the company, moving into sales roles, moving into activation roles, and then also a stint as well over in Australia for a year. Um, then I went back to the UK and I joined Diageo um, for about five years, obviously with a stint over here as well. And then kind of found myself kind of moving around a little bit and kind of getting out of category for a while. So I did a bit of innovation when I was at Diageo working um, in commercialization for them. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I found myself rounding back to category, which I think was my original love. 
kind of where I actually started and now where I am today back into category as the head of the team. So yeah, it's kind of my original love. I've come back. It's kind of gone full circle, full circle but yeah. I've taken all that breadth and opportunity to move around the industry and come back to it. So right. yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. And Chris, over to you to tell us your favorite brand and, and why. Yeah, my favorite brand, not quite as impressive as Angie's, <laughs> but mine's actually Arnott's. Um, I love what they've done with their new snack brands launch. Um, I feel like they've really met a consumer need for some sort of healthy snacking with added benefit, um, but done it in a way that works, but it's also true to their brand. Yeah. Um, they haven't forgotten what makes their business tick, so the core, the core stuff, but as someone who... You know, it was a very, very infrequent shopper of the sugary snacks. It's really brought me back into the category of met, met a need I've been looking for. And from their business point of view, it's helped them emerge or become more visible in a whole bunch of different categories at the same time. So they're, they're my sort of favorite love brand at the moment within the FNCG space. And so clearly another business doing category very well. <laughs> yes, yes. And, uh, and how do you find yourself in category? Um, well, I mean, how did I find myself in FMCG? It's kind of a bit of an accident, really. I, I, uh, I actually have a science background, uh, which kind of does play into this. I did a chemistry degree, um, post studies, went traveling, washed up in Australia, uh, no money, maxed out two credit cards, maxed out the bank, bank of mum, dad, and at least one grandparent and had to get a job. Um, I found a job in liquor. So turned, a, turned a hobby into a profession. I like to say, um, I was in logistics, but. It was only a con contract role, and they said, look, we want to keep you. And we want you to stay in the business. You've got some sales roles. I said, no, 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 no. And I found out more, and, oh, yes, yes, yes. This sounds really good. Yeah. Um, but throughout my time in sales, the category team kept on kind of tapping me on the shoulder, like, hey, you're doing things with numbers that, that other people in sales aren't doing. Do you want to come and join? Um, and I had a sales leader at the time who kept on saying, no, don't do it. Don't do it. It'll, it'll be career limiting. Um, so I eventually moved company for, for progression. And was there, and again, I got tapped on the shoulder and they're saying, hey, you do numbers that other NAMs can't and don't, and you seem to be able to pull data together. So um, the role wasn't quite right for me at the time, so I decided to jump at the opportunity and, and really haven't looked back. So I was actually reflecting this morning, uh, and over the last 11 years that I've spent in category, I've worked across 16 different categories. Um, and you know, I do, really do believe variety is the spice of life. So having that much variety and no two days being the same as really kept me in category and kept me super involved. Yeah, it's true, true breadth. Mm. The way you spoke about getting tapped up by category almost sounded like a secret society <laughs> for coming forward. And we're going to demystify category a, a little bit for anyone who doesn't <laughs> quite know what it's all about. But and and Kate, for you, so you've been on the podcast previously, you've spoken about I think two brands that you you really loved. Tell us about maybe a third one if you if you've got it, and then uh, and yeah, tell us how you you found yourself in category. Yeah, um, um, another my third favorite brand would be um, Chobani. So I think what they've been able to do with the Greek yogurt category has been pretty phenomenal, and it it's it seemed being an outsider. I'm sure it wasn't being an insider, but it seemed being an outsider that it kind of happened overnight. And um, they really revolutionised what was a fairly stagnant felt quite sugary proposition um of a category to to you know where it is today and and there's, there's they're seeing some really strong growth and i think they've done a really good job of premiumizing they've brought in a lot of different products whether you've got something like flip or you know really doubling down on um on shopper insights in relation to proteins so they've brought out a new fit range so yeah lo lots of that Lots of that, that success, I would yeah, say, for that. Right. And then obviously different pack formats and things. So, yeah, yeah really awesome. good job. Yeah. Um, and not too dissimilar, to be honest. Um, my How I did I get into category? I think I was tapped on the shoulder as well for this secret club. Um, and yeah, um, I was in national accounts. I had been in sales for quite some time. So similar, um, sort of 10 years in sales and, and account side and then sort of 10 years in category now. Um, but yeah, I kind of got tapped on the shoulder and and there. Uh, Jump, jump to the chance. I think as well, though, similar, I, I did have a couple of more senior people sort of say back in the time, and I think this was, you know, quite a while ago now, thankfully, and category and the role that category plays within businesses has moved on. But I did have a couple of people say, are you sure you want to do that? I'm not sure that's really, like you've run this great trajectory in sales, stay in sales. Um, so yeah, so it is interesting that there's some commonality between Chris's story and mine. Yeah, and the perspectives 100% change in terms of the advice you'd, you'd get now, considering it moving in this category, which we'll talk about as to why. Great. Okay. So before we jump into the finer details of category, we first want to make sure we're clear on exactly what we're talking about. 
category is still a function that I think um, holds an air of mystique for some people. Maybe if they're looking from the outside in, they're not 100% sure exactly well, what, what is category and what does it do? So um, let, let's talk about how we define that. So, Ange, I'm going to ask you to kick us off. Mm -hmm. this. I know you've got a good analogy <laughs> to talk about category with. So, yeah, to, to kick us off, how would you describe category to someone that's never worked in it? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I could describe category as, you know, grouping products into occasion based or purchase behavior and managing them strategically to drive growth, sales and profit, which sounds great. But actually, I liken, to, liken it to a, a kind of pizza. So I think the category is the pizza. And our job in category is to grow the pizza. So pretty simple. And who doesn't love pizza and a bigger slice of the pizza, right? So our segment is our share of the pizza. So obviously, the more we grow the pizza and drive um, sales based on shopper insight and data-led thinking, the more that we're going to grow our size of the pizza and grow our size of the category. So it's a relatively simple way of explaining it. But when I talk to people about what category is, that's how I describe it, because otherwise people just have no idea. People understand marketing and they understand sales. But when you say you sit in between marketing and sales as a category expert, they're clueless. So the pizza is the best analogy I can come up with. Great answer to use if you're asked at a barbecue, what you do for a living or, or, or at, <laughs> I'm at, gonna a, use that at, at a pizza Steal night. It. <laughs> when, I, when I worked in cash, I always just fell back on, oh, I just work in sales or, or marketing or whatever and kind of copped out. But that's a, that's a great one to, yeah. to refer to. And Kate, from your perspective, how would you define category? How do I? Die? Um, I mean, to build on, on and really, not to repeat, but I think I see category very much as um where can you get growth? Where can you get growth from the overall category? So again, growing, growing that slice. Mm -hmm. Um, and then from a branded perspective as well, what that means for, for the, the business that you work for. I think category gives a really clear framework and process. It, um, gives you, um, you know, same language and, and metrics to be able to then take kind of quite tactical and also strategic opportunities to a retailer. So it really kind of, gives you that platform to do that and to do that well. Yeah, fantastic. And Chris, last but not least. Yeah, well, when asked that question at the barbecue, I don't <laughs> necessarily talk about making the steaks bigger. Um, <laughs> um, but what I kind of tend to say is we, we act as an, a consultant, yeah. Yeah, internally and externally, helping our business and our retailers understand how to bring the category to life for the shopper. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, it's making sure the right products are in the right place in the right way. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, when you talk about sitting between sales and marketing, you know, the analogy I have for sales at least is they're busy explaining yesterday, landing today and planning to deliver tomorrow, or if you're less charitable sandbagging tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but what we really do is actually try and have our heads up and be looking beyond their immediate time frame, yeah. and really hold their hand to guide them through that, uh, to make sure that they're delivering. But then we do the same for marketing, but on that sort of a step out on the horizon again. Yeah. yeah. And to, I think, really bring the inside or the outside, sorry, in, I think as well, that mm. can sometimes get forgotten mm. and the four walls are the four walls. So I think our job as well is to very much bring that inside in and remind people that we are a part of the pizza, mm. not the overall <laughs> pizza. Yeah. I think the, the consultative point there is a really important one because I'm sure in the last few years, there's been plenty of you know, national account managers, national business managers going, hang on, what are these category guys doing and how do I best interact with them and how do I work together? I think, um, yeah, the consultative mm -hmm. piece is really important because it's, it's a, it's a partnership and it's bringing a perspective that sales don't maybe have the capacity and mm -hmm. the room to actually be looking at in their role. Okay. Great. Um, so we've, we've started to get into the specifics of what category looks like in, in, in businesses and it can, it can vary quite, quite wildly. So even looking at your job titles, guys there's you know clearly have different remits and different things fall into your area as a head of category so um maybe chris kick us off on this one tell us what does category management look like at at wreck it well at, at wreck it we split kind of the typical category function into actually two teams so i have a well, there's an adjacent team within the business who spend a lot of time understanding the dynamics of a particular category and how we win with our retailers very commercially and so they, they do a lot of the internal work, um, but then I have the privilege of leading the team that's totally customer facing. So we spend a lot of time working with the customer and listening to the customer, but also we are positioned because we're not coming from a purely commercial lens to be able to be a proper category advisor. Um, 
so that we lead what I like to call our strategic engagement process, which is ultimately what leads through to us handing over the range view meeting um, for the NAM to have that final commercial conversation. But then, and that's what my team do day to day, but then on top of that, uh, I'm responsible for leading our more strategic sort of research and strategy agenda as well. So developing our category growth drivers, um, keeping that refreshed, relevant and aligned to internal and external pressures whilst also having kind of that healthy tension. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, you know, helping understand or lead our, our shopper thinking out beyond where both our global business is, but also where our customers and our local business is to sort of set up for being in the right position in two to three years time. Great. And, and Kate is listening to what Chris has said there. What are the similarities in terms of how Kellogg's category team operates and where are the differences? Yeah. Um, we don't have the luxury of having two separate teams. <laughs> um, so kind of everything that Chris just talked through very much sits within within one team, which does mean we are extremely busy um, and do have lots and lots of stakeholders. Um, so on any given day, we can be commercializing innovation and working with our brand teams um, and, and helping to set the price and the pack size for that innovation. I and mean, obviously what that will do for the category and, and for us from a PL perspective, to range of you speaking to our retailers, we get very much involved in monthly meetings um, and really trying to drive that we're a category team that's involved in the day to day as well. So we're not just a team that's wheeled in you know, taken out of a, a closet and wheeled in every six months for a range of you. We do actually have regular um, interactions, I suppose, with our retailers because it very much helps our thinking. Uh, and to hear that firsthand from a retailer that rather than just through an account team, I think is really valuable. Yeah. And to be really clear so we can articulate back to our business what our retailer strategies are what our strategies are, how they link up, where there's gaps, where there's differences, what does that mean from, um, you know, from a strategic perspective and to be honest, looking at our competitors and working out what role that they might play as well. So similar to Chris, it's, it's very much the, the in-year delivery. I definitely talk about it as mm -hmm. category management's in-year delivery. You've got a JBP and you're, you're, wow. you're there to deliver that in-year piece, but it's also lifting your head up to say, okay, the next two, three, five years, what does that mean? What's what does that mean for our innovation strategy? What does that mean for our core? What does that mean for our RGM piece? Mm -hmm. And yeah, kind of linking that all through. Yeah. So. And the commercial planning piece is interesting because it feels yeah. like in some businesses, category is evolving to more of a commercial planning function yeah. than anything. And the points around bringing in customer strategy feels like a, a, an increasingly um, important part of what category do. Yeah. Um, and from your perspective, mm -hmm. lots you've had, of, lots yeah, two quite different yeah. views here. Was well, it I, I, thought, I think they were quite. I think it was quite yeah. similar actually. Mm -hmm. Apart from the fact it was two teams versus one team, yeah. I think for us at GWF, it's one team. Uh, we don't have the luxury of a massive team of people working on strategy and then customer development. So we we combine it together. I probably take more of a lead role on the strategy piece, so updating the category strategy growth drivers, thinking about future shelf and direction, and thinking about the macro space and mm -hmm. how that's going to change for the shelf as well based on changes that are happening in the market so yeah the one thing that i would say that is slightly different for us is um uh, we do category we do shopper marketing and we also do e-commerce as well which is quite different to uh, both chris and kate um so yeah we we take a kind of firm eye in terms of the b2b part of e-commerce not the consumer part so um, really kind of looking at our digital strategy when we think about B2B and how we can expand and capitalize on opportunities in that space. So that's probably a little bit of a different area, but you can see there's quite a lot of niche functions kind of almost kind of molded into one to some extent, but definitely lots of similarities in terms of what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And to that point around it almost being, uh, you know, multiple functions within one function, yeah. what are the implications for you as a head of category? Yeah. What does your role look like? Well, you've got to play, you've got to put multiple hats on. It's mm -hmm. as simple as that. Now, luckily for me, I've come from a category background. I've done um, activation and I've been lucky enough to be a self-taught digital marketeer as well. So through my own business that I did a few years ago. Um, so I have to play the role of different hats all the time. I think the challenge is for me is um, just kind of making sure that the team are cohesive and linked together and know what each other are doing when you're covering such a vast number of topics. And I feel like that's an area that we always just need to make sure we're gluing on weekly, monthly, our team off sites to make sure we come across as one team because mm -hmm. it's quite easy to be 
to come across as three teams instead of one. So that's my job as a category lead to make sure we're co- cohesively one team and connecting as one team. And Chris, you made the point around with Reckitt splitting the category team into two kind of areas. Um, what are the implications for you in your role in terms of not only connecting with, with your immediate team, but staying connected to the broader category function? Well, yes. I mean, part of the reason we do have the split teams, we've got six categories. Mm-hmm. So, you know, across our team, across our core customers, we deliver about 20 range reviews a year, plus supporting our ancillary customers. So it's very much driven by the process. That's one of the things that we we kind of miss, but we've worked very hard at developing over the past few years and um, stitching that into our, our op model, as well as our customers' op models, kind of being that bridge. Um, so... A very strong process helps us make sure that as we switch from category to category and customer to customer that we know the topics we need to be discussing. We get the teams in in the rooms and have active discussions. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, very strong um, engagement with our senior team as well. So that, that really helps us get up to speed quickly um, in terms of leading people through that process, um, make sure we're landing the objectives we need. And then it's on to the next one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Sometimes doing two or three at the same time. So yeah, yeah. It, it really that that planning that strong process really helps us keep yeah. doing that. Great. And Kate, it feels like the the key difference with your team is that element of RGM that sits within category yeah. directly at Kellogg. So, what does that mean for you? And I guess um, when did that become part of the category function at Kellogg's? And and, and what's the learning curve like been like for you in terms of actually heading that up as a as a function? Yeah, um, it's it kind of as I joined the business. So um, I joined and my role had been recreated, so to speak, to to include um, the RGM team. So it was a, it was a restructure at the time. Um, I've been with Kellogg's coming up to three years now. So it's been sort of the last three years. Um, I think as well, like the, the, the reason behind the change of the structure was if you think about the five marketing P's, it was to have all of those to sit within one team. So from a product perspective, Obviously, you know, whilst we don't own products specifically, um, but it's still very much that the commercialization of, of the innovation of the product and then all the way through to assortment range, that type of thing. Um, price and promotion, obviously kind of two key levers as part of RGM. There was then placement and then POS. So it's the, the idea is to have all of that in one team so we can drive it from strategy all the way through to execution. And it's kind of similar to what Andrew was saying. It's that one team mentality. So we are pretty close knit team. And whilst I have um, experts that are from more of a category perspective, more of an RGM perspective, more of a shopper slash customer marketing perspective, it, it, we, because we can get together really quickly, it enables it to be quite well linked and quite streamlined. It, as mentioned, it means that there's a lot on a lot of the time, but it does help in that you don't have to go to another team who reports into another person and potentially a different director. Things can get kind of ironed out quite quickly when we notice challenges or gaps or or, or even opportunities that we want to drive harder. Yeah. And, and Chris, you mentioned when we spoke before uh, the podcast that RGM sits in an adjacent team at, mm-hmm. at Rickett. So um, tell us, how does that dynamic work and what interaction do you have with them as a, as a function? We very much interact with each other as, as needs be. There are forums when we're there uh, jointly and can share expertise, but it comes being connected into the day-to-day management of the business. That's kind of part of my leadership role as well, being there to hear the, the things that the other teams are discussing and the challenges that the business have and, and being able to bring that category lens in, be it from the pure category or from the customer's category priority, which sometimes the sales team miss in the scrum of the day to day. Um, so there's that piece, but so there's a lot we can feed in to help add richness and rigor to some of the work that those teams do. But then because we do sit across a lot of categories, mm. we lean on them when we come to spinning up for a new, a new category and really focusing on that. Um, cause they're the day to day experts. They're really, really super close on what the competitors are doing and how all the commercial activations are, are delivering or not delivering results in market. So it kind of flows two ways, depending upon the, upon the work stream we have on. But yeah, we're, we're lucky in that team tends to have come through the NAM cohort. We have a very close relationship with the sales team. I have a, a team member plugged into each of the major accounts. So we work, we have that pre-established relationship and work very closely. So they understand what we're doing and we understand what they're doing. So it's, yeah. 
you know, although we are separate teams, it's quite a tight knit team within our, our border sales team anyway. Yeah. And and given the the, the space that um, TipTop play in, RGM very different role within your yeah. your business. And I know it's such a hot topic at the moment. Um, mm. We just are very we're a non promoted category in bread, um, but obviously RGM is not just about promotions; it's about price, it's about pack architecture, it's the whole piece. Um, but yeah, we, we kind of view it a little bit differently. It doesn't really sit within the category team as such. We would provide um, Intel, so pretty similar to Chris, around Intel, around uh, promotional effectiveness, particularly for bakery snacks, which is a promoted category, um, into the sales and the comms finance functions. But they basically essentially do a lot of the price pack architecture modeling um, with the sales team. Uh, we would provide inputs, uh, as I mentioned, but obviously in terms of those decisions and what happens with pack price structure, all those things, then that's really very much with the sales and the commercial teams. So, yeah, it's quite different. Yeah. And um, Kate, you, your perspective in terms of um, the changes you've seen in category as a function in, in recent times and how you see it evolving into the future, because it is an, ev an ever-changing function. Um, which is moving in different directions in different businesses. But what was your perspective on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely a function that will continue to evolve. I, I think I've said this prior, but I do very much see category as a, even just as a term changing, um, I think, and, and what will sit and what that team will do will evolve significantly. I actually see, see there's probably more to this revenue growth piece mm -hmm. as a bit of a, ca a catch all, to yeah. be honest, for, for a lot of what we do. So, so I think that will continue to evolve. Um, and I think as well, like, you know, our, the retailers in this country particularly are getting a lot more sophisticated. They're getting a lot more savvy and they're demanding a lot more from suppliers. And as a, as a result, category over the last sort of 10 or so years that I've been in here, we've had to up our game. Um, we've had to get a lot more data centric, um, and, and really kind of push, push our business to bring that inside in and, and be the voice of the customer. Uh, yeah. So I think it will continue to evolve. Um, I think as well, yes, price and promotion at the moment are super important because of the current environment that we're in. We all know that we're, we're seeing a lot, you know, a lot higher uplifts on promotion. And we know that there's kind of a bit of a dual shopper piece happening in that you've got shoppers coming in that are just picking on, that are just picking up a product on, on pickup price. So tends to be smaller products at a, a, a smaller pickup price because they've got, I don't know, 50 or a hundred dollars to spend as part of that shop. And then you've got another customer or another shopper, sorry, that is buying on dollar per kilo or dollar per hundred gram as they see it on the price ticket. And they're willing to um, spend more in that one transaction because they're actually going to effectively make money, to be honest, further down the line, because they're not going to have to come back and repeat purchases quickly. Yeah. Um, but I think um, if I think about that, I think growth um, across the board over the next few years, not to sound like a Debbie Downer, <laughs> but I think it's going to get really challenging um, for the FMCG, um, for FMCG in totality. And I don't think it's just limited to Australia. I think this is probably going to be a bit of a worldwide phenomenon, but um, I think channel, your channel strategy and your channel mix and the mix is going to really play an important um, point of view over the next sort of 24 months and to get really clear on what you're trying to do, who you're trying to target and therefore what, what you need to do to target them better to get that growth. And I think a lot of it will come down to your channel mix. And Chris and Anne, your, your perspective, what are the changes you've seen in, in, in category going off what Kata said there and what, what yeah. do you, what do you see happening in the future? Yeah, I think, um, there's a lot of things you just touched on there that are definitely part of the evolution of the category, kind of category function, if you like, overall. And I think for me, it's about kind of category kind of forming, being at the heart of the business planning process. Yeah. And everything kind of flowing from there. And I think it's baby steps in making changes, right? Um, kind of pushing it in the right direction and making sure that category is at the heart of everything you do. It sits at the start of all your business planning and then everything flows out of it. I just think it takes time to evolve that. Um, and category strategies, um, you may have developed them two, three years ago. You con constantly need to refresh them and bring them to life again. Um, and, you know, just make sure they're still very embedded within the business. So I think there's an evolution part there. What I have noticed as well through JBP is that um, definitely in terms of our contact matrix is definitely getting broader, which is fantastic. So if you think about a range of view conversation in the past, it used to be with the grand final almost. You go to the customer and it's the grand <laughs> final and here it is, here's your range of view. But now it's a continuous conversation to the range of view. 
So that has definitely changed in terms of that trust and connection between sales and category and ability to to go out there and have those conversations directly without having your NAM or your any of the sales team of support. So I think that that is fantastic as well. Um, and I think there's smaller steps I find this particularly frustrating around future shelf. Um, so how I think that the macro space and the future shelf should be evolving. This is a painfully slow moving topic. Um, and I, and I understand why, because the tenure of most buyers is 18 months and they just want to get stuff done. Right. Um, so it's a tricky one to think about where the future shelf is going in the next three to five years, but it's very much hot on my agenda and something that I'm deeply passionate about when I work in a category that could be defined as quite cold and sterile. And I want to bring it to life and make it more exciting um, to shop for the shopper and build a better shopping experience. But it's slowly moving in the right direction. It's just painfully slow. Further to what Kate said, actually, I think value is going to become more and more important and understanding the dimensions of value. Uh, you spoke to, to two shoppers. I, I actually think certainly in our categories, we're, we're way beyond two shoppers. There's so many different shopper behaviors manifesting at shelf that it's clear that the shopper is becoming less and less homogenous. And some of our retailers are responding to that. So it's going to be incumbent upon us as the people sort of thinking of it further down the road. How do we respond to that? And what are the implications for our retailer strategy and for our strategy? Um, and then how we, the tactics we execute through that. So I think that's a sort of the medium term piece that category is going to have to get very involved in. Um, and, you know, I think that stems out as well from a, a piece around what sets the, the, the top tier category teams apart from each other is those that can generate their own IP. Most companies can buy all the data and you have a fair chance at putting, putting some really, you know, useful and interesting insights and actionable strategies out of it. But what is it that you do that your competitors can't? What is it that, that's your original uh, incisive thinking that really gets the your business on board, but gets your your customer to then buy in as well to what you are doing as a business? Um, I, I think that's going to become more and more relevant. If you look at particularly the likes of Woolworths, they're developing more and more kind of parachute teams to access the the data tools they continue to build. Uh, and you would have to think, looking at the success that's had, having Coles had, had come on board with that as well at some time. Um, so there's, in some ways, there's decreased reliance on just being a through resource to do some analysis for the customer. Uh, so that's the first piece. And then the other piece is how we deal with the emergence of online. Um, you know, the, the fundamentals of category development, as, as Kate framed it in her podcast that came out recently about delivering the in year and, and landing the range reviews for this year and, and, and into next in the physical store are very well understood and not overly commercialized. So you, know, you can argue very clearly how to lay out the shelf, what should be there, what shouldn't be there. And yes, there's a degree of commercial behind it, but someone can't rock up next week and just pay for a better spot on shelf. Um, whereas you know, online, someone tomorrow could pay for a better spot than you. Mm. So it's how we bring that category execution into the day-to-day -day of the business for the omni shopper. Um, and we're working at it, but we haven't cracked it. Um, our marketing team are kind of out ahead of it and we've put a lot of resource into the sales team, but it's every year it's, it's transformation again and again and again. And what I haven't cracked and I'm working quite hard on is where do we fit as a, as a category development team in that? Great. And presumably you'd all be big advocates for people spending time working in category as a, as a function. And you give quite different advice from Kate, what you had early in your, your career. So with everything we've spoken about today in mind and, you know, with, with the idea we want to give actionable career advice to our, our, our listeners, um, what would be your advice for someone either working in category who wants to maximize their potential or someone who's maybe not working in category but is kind of category curious and considering it as a potential path for them? Kate, what would be your advice? Um, gosh, um, I think... If you're in category, it's it's very much just about how can you continue to develop your skill set. And I think strategic thinking and, and thinking broader and longer term is, is a great way of doing that. 
Uh, there is lots of data available to everyone, especially in the organizations that, that, that we work in around this table. So really kind of understanding what data points you've got um, and and trying to distill those and commercial distill some of those insights and commercialize those insights um, for growth opportunities rather than and, and thinking longer term rather than just in in year. And I think um for someone that, you know, isn't in category and would like to come in, it, it, you know, remain curious, like be that person that's asking the questions, be that person that's trying to get into a range of you. You know, if you, if you don't know how a range of you structured and the process that the business goes through, ask to be involved. Um, JBP, same thing, ask to be involved or you want to understand how and know the innovation strat and calendars pull together again, ask to be involved. So I think, yeah, just really remain curious and, and push for where you feel you've got gaps that if you were to then interview for a category role, you could at least be able to articulate, um, some of the experience that, that you may have. If even though you haven't actually done the role. Yeah, for sure. And that's a really important point because quite often with it, with any cross-functional move, people will say, well, how can I make the move if I don't have the experience? But it's about what can you do in your current role? What exposure can you get? What mentors can you get on yeah, your side? Totally. So that you can show up to that job interview or speak to that connection and talk credibly to the things that you do know and you can you can build on. Totally, yeah. And Chris, your, your advice? Well, I think I might build off Kate's mm. point. Foster that natural inquisitiveness people who do well in category and who thrive in category, because it can be demanding, I'm not saying other roles aren't, um, but it can be very demanding, but that inquisitiveness is what kind of drives you through. It's the little drug that you get hooked on and finding that nugget or that bit of understanding that changes how your business and your customer businesses execute. Um, if you're in a sales role, because we, we do recruit a lot of people from sales, focus on developing those analytical skills. Um, you have to be comfortable with data. You have to understand how it works. So find the space in your role to start doing that. And, you know, every NAM certainly should understand category anyway. So start working on that. Mm. Um, that that's that's your, your platform to, to jump in. In terms of your longer career, um, obviously there's a challenge or quite a comparatively we've got quite small P&Ls in this market, which, which mean we have flat structures. Can be very challenging. So my advice is step back and understand what your goal is. If you, if you want to have a longer term category career and work out what your gaps are, then take your moves to, to plan that. Now you can add breadth. As I said, I've, I've had 16 odd categories and each one of those is, has been fantastic. But more than that, each business I've worked in has had a real different facet of category. Um, you know, Goodman Field are we were like the, the commercial and executional and operational brains of the cross-functional team. And that was fantastic. Now I'm very focused on the strategy and the longer term delivery. So, you know, each of your roles needs to flesh that out, but you also need to work out what experience you need to fill out. Um, and in terms of something quite practical, actually some really good category courses available online through third party providers. They're not free, but they're not prohibitively expensive. Um, that can really set you up. Um, and then I think the last piece as well is don't underestimate the value that you bring. When you're looking for a new role, it may be a step up, it may be a step into something unfamiliar. But as I always say to people when I when they come into my team, I ask them, okay, what aren't we doing? What can we do better? Because category is done differently everywhere. And there's so much experience out there that you bring. I'm always hungry to change the way we do business when someone comes in with a fresh perspective. And and yeah, you know, I would say brainwash, but before they get stuck in the day to day and 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 um uh, you know, become part of how we do it. We want to change how we do it and bring bring that experience in. And the breadth you mentioned there is a, is a really key point. I think until fairly recently, the thinking was, okay, maybe I'm in sales. I'm going on a fairly linear path. I need to jump across and spend some time in category, tick the box, and then I can come back into mm -hmm. into sales. I think as we've kind of explored today, there's so much richness to category, and it is an increasingly commercial function. So you, you can jump into the category and spend a few years and get. Tremendous breadth across businesses, categories, functions, which sets you up to go more senior within category or kind of explode back into sales or marketing as, as a much more well-rounded professional. So, um, and Anne, do you anything you yeah. build on from the guys here? I thought that was awesome, by the way, guys. I think you covered pretty much most <laughs> of the key points. The only one I would just add is work your networks. So whether you're in category or you want to get into category. Um, so within category, obviously, there's a lot of networks between in, in brand team and also in sales team internally, externally. For a business like GWF, 
We've got lots of sister companies as well. And we're a global business that is based out of the UK. So work networks, because that will really help expand kind of kind of where you think the future can take you and what skill gaps you can um, kind of work on um, to kind of, you know, to address as you're kind of working through your career development. And then if you are not currently in category, work your networks as well, because you may be in a, an analyst in a finance role or in the food service team, for example, who's doing sales and um, analytical work. And basically, you will have an aspiration to get into category, then make sure you're working your networks within the category team, you're building connections, um, and that you're um, working with the insights team as well, because essentially, that's kind of where it will really help you kind of nut out what you need to do in your role. Because whilst you're in those jobs, you can still get a lot of experience, particularly around storytelling. Mm -hmm. So uh, particularly, particularly if you're working, you know, I don't know, working with the insights team, but you can start to feel, start to work out how you can connect the dots, build stories, um, and then get experience from a customer point of view as well. So I think they're, they're critical, but yeah, my advice would be work your networks and make sure that you're connected internally, externally up and down the organization. Cause that's where the doors can open for you, whether you want to get into category or whether you're currently in category and you want to move. Great advice. The networking piece is, is so key. When you guys talked about your, your pathways into category, there was mentions of, taps on the shoulder mm. and being approached and that's all a result of the networks that you've that you've built and the external piece is a, is really important we can become so um sort of uh, tunnel vision within the business that we work in and actually build a great network within that organization but we forget to do the external piece as well um so great great advice um okay so that brings us to the end of our conversation today to everyone listening, hope you enjoyed the conversation. Um, at AXR, we are specialists in recruiting for FMCG, category sales and marketing. Um, so please do reach out to any of the team at AXR, myself, Mike or Amelia, if you're curious to have a, a career conversation. And in the meantime, you can find Ange, Chris and Kate on LinkedIn. Speaking of networks, she'll be very appreciative of any, any connections, happy to respond to messages and, and kind of unpack in more detail anything we've covered today. So thanks so much for being here, guys. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks Thank so much. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast from AXR Recruitment and Search. We're passionate about helping you get the most out of your sales and marketing career. Keep listening as we bring you more career insights and advice from Australia's top sales and marketing leaders. You just can't get this career advice anywhere else. My name is Mike Dixon. See you next time on Your Future in Sales and Marketing.